Let's talk robots. So when you think about robots, you might think about iRobot from Asimov, or maybe your thoughts are HAL 9000 from 2001 Space Odyssey, or maybe you're an R2-D2 fan. Well, all of these are science fiction. They're figments of the imagination. But in reality, robots are with us in everyday life. So for example, the last car that you drove here was most likely to be assembled by a robot. Robots are exceptionally good at many tasks. So for example, precision painting, or algorithms to solve Rubik's cubes, or the driverless Google car, or the big dog that can take heavy loads throughout a rough terrain, or the uh, ASIMO, which is the world's most sophisticated bipedal walking robot. But there's one thing that characterizes all of the existing robots today, which they're treated like big, heavy, dangerous machines that are separated from humans by the yellow tape. So they're not things that we want to be close to. So what about robots instead that could work alongside humans, that could augment human capability? Well, in the past few years, advances in lightweight materials, advances in sophisticated computer control, and also advances in the neuroscience and how the brain operates has led to uh, new capabilities for a generation of robots that work alongside humans. And they're out there already. If you have your prostate removed, it's highly likely that it'll be done through robot surgery. So one of these da Vinci surgical systems where the surgeon operates a joystick and the robot is inside you manipulating the organs. That means that the surgeon can do what they're good at, which is make decisions and delicate control, and the robot can do what it's good at, which is to get itself into spaces where a surgeon's hand can't fit. So I'm going to want to talk about a small space in these cooperative robot field, which is robots that you can actually wear, and so the field of wearable robots. There is the idea, so think, think Iron Man suits. But don't think Iron Man suits where you're going to fly, but rather think Iron Man suits that allow you to just do a little bit more than what you can do now. Or think about someone with a mobility impairment who can, for example, walk again with a wearable robot. What kinds of tasks would these robots be suitable for? So let's take a look at the apple that we heard about in the first talk. If uh, a robot were to pick those apples and harvesting apples, it would be an impossible task for an autonomous robot for a number of reasons. First, being able to find and reach a apple in the complex space that's a tree is too challenging. Second, being able to pull the apple with sufficient force to pull it off the stem, yet at the same time not to bruise the fruit is an impossible task. And then third, Deciding which are the ripe apples and which are the not ripe apples is impossible for a robot to do. But how about a robot that works alongside a human? Now, for a human, this is a back-breaking task, but humans are very good at deciding which are the ripe apples and which are the not ripe apples. So why not have a robot and a human working together where the robot provides the brawn and the human provides the brains? So let's talk about a few, um, uh, a few wearable robots. And I'm going to start off talking about a muscle-powered wearable robot. The particular application I want to talk about is spinal cord injury. When you move, the signal starts in your brain and travels down through the neurons to the spinal cords, gets about mid-back, makes a connection to another nerve, then goes down to the muscle, and the muscle contracts to make you move. With a spinal cord injury, what happens is that your spinal cord is cut or crushed, and it's like cutting the telephone cable between your brain and the machinery. The machinery is still perfectly good and works perfectly well, but the problem is that you cannot control that machinery. So it turns out that if you apply pulses of electricity to that muscle, either with an implanted electrode or from the surface, you can get that muscle to contract in the limb to move, and the muscle really doesn't care whether it's got a signal normally or it's signal through the electrical stimulator. So that's kind of a hard concept to believe, so let me, uh, let me show you. So I've got myself wired up with a electrode on my biceps, in fact, two electrodes, and I've got a little box that can apply pulses of electricity 
to those electrodes. And I've got the, the volume knob right here that um, adjusts the strength of that contraction. So I'm just going to sit here uh, relaxed with my arm by my side and turn up the volume. And I feel my muscle contracting. There my arm goes up. And I turn down the volume. Arm goes down, up, and, and down. So the, the muscle doesn't really care to some extent whether it's activated this way or whether it's activated through the normal neural sequence. So here is Kelly, and Kelly is paralyzed from the waist down, and she is able to walk. It's a very um, slow walk. It's about one-tenth the speed that you and I walk, but nevertheless, she is able to walk because her um, uh, pads of uh, electrical um, um, contacts are on her legs, and it's to a computer that's sequencing the walking. So here's an, that's an example of a muscle-powered robot that can provide a little bit more capability to a individual that they otherwise might not have. All right, so now let's take a look at non-muscle-powered uh, robots. Uh, and this gets us more into this idea of these uh, very um, uh, uh, simplified low-power Iron Man suits. So one of the questions you might want to ask yourself and especially these are the kinds of questions that as an engineer we ask ourselves, well, gosh, if we're going to build these simplified Iron Man suits, how much power do we have to give people in order for it to be, do something useful? So then the question is, how much power do people have? Well, it turns out that on the one hand, it's, it's impressive. So for example, if you are an elite athlete and you are, say, on a spinning cycle and you go for five minutes, then you can produce about 1,000 watts of power during that five minutes. If you're that same athlete, and we're talking elite athletes, sort of in the Lance Armstrong category, and you want to go for 100 minutes, then the total mechanical output power that you can produce is about 350 watts, not so much. You and I, walking around on a daily basis over the course of the whole day, we all put out about 100 watts of mechanical power. So we individually are pretty much like a light bulb. So on the one hand, that's sort of disappointing. Gosh, you know, I'm feeling strong and powerful, but I'm just like a 100 watt light bulb. But on the other hand, as a designer that's thinking about these wearable machines, it's like, hmm, OK, all I have to do is build a machine that can add 100 watts of mechanical power to you, and you can do something that makes you either twice as strong or something that's repetitive and you can do it twice as long. And that, that's quite an achievable thing to, to think about. So uh, let's, um, I want uh, to tell you about a uh, power suit that we've been developing and the particular power suit is a, uh, a power ankle. And so why the ankle? The ankle turns out to be a pretty interesting joint to study these kinds of technologies. Um, it doesn't move very much. Your ankle moves about 23 degrees. And the torque is um, big, but not so big. So to, to lift you up and down on your toes takes about 75 Newton meters. And then your, your ankle um, kind of has a lot of power, but not a lot of power. So this plot shows you the time history of power in your ankle as you take one step. Your ankle produces about 13 watts, which isn't too much but it peaks to 200 watts. That's that spring in your step right at toe off. And so that's kind of an interesting challenge to reproduce that power cycle that gets us engineers excited. So here's our vision of our ankle power suit. And the idea is that it's got a compact power supply. It's got a compact motor at the joint. And it's got some sensors and can give you the capability of your, your normal ankle. And our specs are we want it to weigh about one kilogram, two pounds. That's about the weight of a heavyweight hiking boot, because any more than that interferes with your gait. We like it to fit under a loose-fitting pair of pants, not skinny jeans. And we'd like it to last about 3,000 steps between recharge. So that's our challenge. So in order to do that, we need small, lightweight motors. We've determined that those small, lightweight motors should be um, fluid power or hydraulic driven. Now, this is a kind of technology that ordinarily you think about for big yellow construction machines. So for example, here's an excavator that was digging the light rail line in Minneapolis. And what, when you look at that excavator, what's intriguing is that that hydraulic piston at the top 
can produce 275,000 pounds of force, yet it's still relatively lightweight. The reason why that's good for a power suit, if I wanted to drive my wrist, and I had a big heavy motor on my wrist, it would mean that the motor that's on my shoulder would not only have to carry the weight of my arm, but also the weight of that big heavy motor on the wrist. So I want something lightweight. So now the reason why these pistons are lightweight is it has to do with fundamentally with how they produce force. The force in this piston is the pressure in the chamber times the area of the piston. And the reason why that's intriguing is that we can increase the force just by increasing the pressure, but that does not add to the weight or not add to the size. So we can go up and up in pressure with a very small lightweight motor and, and have tremendous amounts of force. So that's why we're thinking about um, fluid power to drive our, our ankle suit. Yet at the same time, these devices can have very um, precise precision control. So here's that same excavator with that 275,000 pounds, yet it's, the bucket is operating six inches from the construction worker's head. So that says good precision control is, is possible. So one of the things we want to do is be able to predict how heavy our machines are going to be and how efficient they're going to be. So as engineers, we use a lot of mathematical equations that, that capture some of the basic properties. And the key behind what I want to show you here is that sometimes you can be in mathematical la-la land, but every now and then you want to check, does it predict in real life? So the takeaway from what you see here is you see all the dots. Those are what we measured experimentally on real components. And the lines are our theoretical predictions for where they should be. So that means that we can use our theories to make predictions on how heavy, for example, our ankle suits are going to be. So how heavy is that going to be? Well, if I wanted to give you a power suit that produced 100 watts, and I were to build it out of electric motors, then it's going to weigh about 600 grams. If I were to do a hydraulic power suit and run it at 100 pounds per square inch, it would weigh 750 grams. So that doesn't sound very exciting. That sounds pretty heavy. But if I were to take that same hydraulic system and run it at 1,000 pounds per square inch, it could weigh as low as 80 grams. Now that's what gets us excited about the potential for lightweight power suits. Version one of our device looks like this. Uh, this is um, kind of uh, interesting and not interesting at the same time. So it's got plenty powerful. It'll lift you up on your toes, no problem. But this is what happens when you purchase off the shelf components to make your power suits. It ends up essentially being a pretty much of a boat anchor. It weighs about six kilograms, about 12 pounds, and certainly would not fit under any but the loosest of pants legs. So I can only show you the vision of where we're going because this new device is on the drawing boards right now. But basically, our next generation will look something like this. And we feel this is a fairly realistic rendition, the difference being that the components are custom and we're running this at 2,000 pounds per square inch in order to get that small scale size. Now, we also need small lightweight power sources. So we would love to have that glowy thing that's on Iron Man, but that's a figment of the imagination. So what can we use instead? Here's a powered ankle foot orthosis from our friends uh, in collaborating youth research at the University of Illinois. And this is an individual with a uh, motor impairment where the powered ankle foot orthosis does restore the spring in his step. It's powered by a compressed gas canister, the same that you use in a paintball gun. And you know, it turns out to be work fine, but that compressed gas canister weighs 20 ounces, and it only lasts for 2,000 steps. So maybe you're going, OK, why don't we use batteries? How about the battery that's in my, my fancy cell phone here? Well, as an engineer, you look about energy density. That is, how much energy is in a battery per weight? So here's um, what it is for, a, um, for your cell phone. And this is in megajoules per kilogram, about 0.6. But instead, if you use methanol, which is a form of hydrocarbon fuel, it has about 25 times the energy density. So that is, you can store 25 times the energy density in a hydrocarbon fuel than you can in a battery. 
That's the reason why our cars run on gasoline, because the energy density is so high. So now you've just got one final problem. How do you go from that, uh, that, that hydrocarbon fuel to a compressed fluid to run your, your robot? So that's when you use this. What I'm holding in my hand is the world's smallest internal combustion air compressor. So this is a device that goes from hydrocarbon fuel directly to compressed air. And yes, it's a little bit noisy and a little bit smelly and does get a little bit hot, but we think there's tremendous potential for technology like this in order to drive the next generation of wearable robots. So what I hope I've done is to convince you that what you really want to do is to walk around with 2,000 pounds per square inch of hydraulics at your ankle and a gasoline engine on your waist. But what I really hope that I've done is to convince you that the next five years are going to be very exciting ones for the next generation of wearable robots. Thank you.